15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility. We is on the moon. Neil Armstrong. Armstrong. 38 year old American standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. everyone this is B and today I'm going to talk about the first United States commemorative coin the 1892 1893 Columbus half dollar there is a lot of history but mostly story behind this event much more than I expected thought it would be easy to research this topic but the information just kept coming in and I had to decide where to leave it so here goes, this is just a portion of what I found out about it. Hope you enjoy learning about this as much as I did. have been popular as collector's items since the very beginning of coins and are used as a way to commemorate historical persons or events from the past been held in remembrance for the future kind of like a souvenir from a special event the United States has issued the most commemorative coins in the world this is due to the fact that almost all of them have historical significance depicting the progress and advancement of a nation as a whole. Two congressional committees consider commemorative coins before they are minted, and they are the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, and the House Financial Services Committee. Congress must approve them also. Then the coin program is advised by the Independent Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee, and the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts that advise the Secretary of Treasury how it will be designed. Commemorative coins are mostly sold to collectors with some of the coins having as little as 20,000 total mintage numbers. And from 1892 to 1954, presentation pieces and proof strikings were minted in even smaller limited numbers. So you can imagine that they can be very rare and valuable compared to regular distributed coins, which are minted in the millions. Prior to 1982, commemorative coins were not normally placed into circulation or sold at face value. They were distributed by an agency promoting an event being celebrated. Any unsold surplus coins were put directly toward funding that particular event 
and sold for a premium as souvenirs and collector's items, but at the same time still having monetary value. There are regular coins that are considered commemorative in nature, such as the 1909 Lincoln cent, the 1976 bicentennial coins, and Washington quarters issued 1999 to 2021. Modern commemorative coins are dated starting in 1982 to present and are solely distributed through the U.S. Mint with proceeds going directly to the government and then to various organizations after that. By 1988, commemorative coins had reached the top of their popularity with the public, but due to an un unstable economy, people who normally don't collect coins panicked and started buying them, which always drives the price up. Heavy investors had drove the prices of the coins so high, collect collectors could not afford the quality ones and they had to settle for lesser ones. For collectors, this up and down roller coaster effect can be good or bad depending on how you perceive it or use it to your advantage. The commemorative coin frenzy had slowed down and dwindled considerably by 1990, which allowed once again for numismatic coin collectors to obtain higher quality coins. Gaining our so-called independence from Great Britain and the United Kingdom was the first revolution the United States had to endure, which took its toll on the people. Not just in the U.S., but the entire world's population had decreased significantly due to catastrophes, plagues, and wars prior to the Industrial Revolution that took place between 1760 and 1940. Generations later, when the popula population numbers began to increase again, it sparked a demand for more consumer goods and services to accommodate the larger volume of people. So an industrial revolution would have been seriously needed since most or all of the previous knowledge and technology from the old world had been lost and or destroyed along with the population that had developed it. This became the initial idea and main reason world fairs and expositions were started. Fairs and expositions were held all over the world during this time as reset people formed countries taking over land that had been mud flooded and previously inhabited by different old world people, such as Tatarians, native tribes, and clans. These events provided countries and nations a way of showcasing their technological advances and, invent and inventions for manufacturing products to other countries and nations. This in turn allowed many skills and ideas to be shared among others in the same trade or field for all to benefit and learn from. World fairs and expositions were also used as platforms for encouraging development of international trade and tourism. The narrative we have been told is that expositions and world fairs were for the greater good of all countries participating. But I believe that the public was all being given a last look at the old world before it was to be dismantled, erased, and changed forever. Here is the official definition and explanation of what these events are and how they were started. World's Fair describes the event in the United States and exposition is commonly used abroad in other countries and since 1967, the shorter term expo has been used worldwide since then. Bohemia Habsburg Prague monarchy is credited with hosting the very first national industrial exhibition on the occasion of the coronation of Leopold II, King of Bohemia in 1791 and showcased many sophisticated new manufacturing methods. Nicolas Louis Francois de Neuf Chateau of France is credited for hosting the first public industrial exposition in 1798. A series of expositions followed in France after, but the first international one occurred 
in 1855 and mostly showcased agricultural innovations. The first world and most famous exposition, the Great Exposition, was held in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, in 1851. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria are credited for its inception of showcasing manufactured products from all over the world. Two years later, in 1853, the first World Exposition in the United States of America was held in Bryant Park, New York City, and named the Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. The most famous attractions were the New York Crystal Palace, the Lading Observatory, a wooden tower for visitors that stood 315 feet high, the elevator brake developed by Elijah Otis of the famed Otis Elevator Company, and the Quadricycle, a pedal-powered four-wheeled car-like vehicle. The most famous exp exposition in Paris, France, was the Exposition Universal of 1889 for which it claims the Eiffel Tower was built as an attraction. At the time, there were many critics that opposed its construction and demanded it be dismantled after the fair closed. Ironically, it still stands today and has become the most famous tourist attraction in Paris, France, and its image is represented as the worldwide symbol for it. Nowadays, there is more evidence being discovered that the tower was more likely built for harnessing atmospheric electricity or a free energy type of antenna that conducted elect electrical power, which makes more practical sense than what we have been told about its history. By far the most famous exposition held in the United States was the World's Columbian Exposition and Fair of 1893. The fair opened May 1st, 1893 and closed on October 30th, 1893 and was where the first U.S. commemorative coins were introduced and sold. The event was sponsored with financing from many prominent civic, professional and commercial leaders from all around the United States that participated in producing, coordinating and managing the fair. Some of the most famous financiers include railroad manufacturing magnate John Whitfield Bunn, Chicago Shoe Company owner Charles H. Schwab, and Connecticut banking, insurance, and iron products magnate Milo Barnum Richardson. With all the funding and donations that the fair took in, the money was misappropriated due to the commissioners and managers lack of experience, overspending and infighting of who was in charge of what. Therefore, the commissioners and managers decided to ask the government for the shortage of funds needed to finally complete all the construction that was still needed. In 1892, Congress decided to pass an act approving their, their request but with the stipulation that commemorative coins be sold at double the price of face value to cover the costs of minting the coins. Ohio Senator John Sherman warned that minting five million pieces would destroy their value as souvenirs. So between Sherman's argument and the blazing summer heat, Congress agreed to mint 2.5 million instead of the original five million that was requested. Most of the silver coinage being produced at the time had the French goddess of liberty on them, which personified freedom, but no real significance or distinction for the United States of America. The theme for the exposition was the 400th anniversary of Col Christopher Columbus' arrival to the New World, so naturally he was the choice to be put on the half dollar, thus becoming the first person put on the first United States commemorative coin. The half dollar was designed by Olin Lewis Warner and was to be a representation of Columbus's voyage in his ship, the Santa Maria, when first arriving to the New Americas. The Overse has the bust of the explorer Christopher Columbus and the reverse depicts Columbus's ship, 
the Santa Maria positioned above the two hemispheres that make up the global earth. The obverse was engraved by the chief engraver for the Philadelphia Mint, Charles E. Barber, and the reverse was engraved by George T. Morgan. 950,000 of the coins were first struck in 1892. 1,550,405 of the coins were minted in 1893, with both series approximately 100 brilliant proofs were struck for each date. A total of 5 million coins were struck, which was far beyond the actual agreed amount of 2.5 million that was allotted by Congress in the original agreement, with half of them ending up being returned for melting. Only 400,000 were actually sold at the premium price, and 2 million ended up being released into circulation, where they were still circulating as late as the 1950s. The half dollar is comprised of 0 0.9000 silver and weighs 12.5 grams with a diameter of 30.6 millimeters and a reeded edge. Both the 1892 and the 1893 coins list from $20 for an AU50 to $675 for an MS66. NGC has a listing for an MS Proof 70 as high as $1,600. The company that produced the Remington typewriter paid an astounding $10,000 for the first coin struck as a publicity stunt. The amount would be equal to a quarter of a million dollars nowadays. In 1890, U.S. Congress authorized the exposition and legislated there be a board of gentlemen managers and a separate board of lady managers, due in part to Susan B. Anthony's work in advocacy for the suffrage movement of women's rights. The most successful hotel in Chicago, known as the Palmer House, was owned by a couple named Potter and Bertha Palmer. Bertha, being quite the socialite, took the role of heading the board of lady managers. She and the other women decided there should be a commemorative coin created for the lady managers as well, since they were doing the same work as the gentlemen. Palmer, after much insistence, managed to convince the House Appropriations Committee to have $10,000 of the money the ladies were to be paid for their job of managing be paid in the form of souvenir quarters. She finally got the coin approved by Congress and the Secretary of Treasury, but only got 40,000 minted. Palmer found a woman designer named Caroline Petal through the famous sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens to do the job, but due to disagreements and objections over the design with the chief mint engraver in Philadelphia, Charles E. Barber, she declined the project. Since there had been so much time wasted over the design of the coin, Palmer was left with no choice but to let Barber design the coin. Queen Isabella I of Spain was the choice for the overse for providing the funding of Columbus's voyage and arrival to the New Americas. The reverse design had a kneeling woman holding a distaff symbolizing patient industry and the wordage Board of Lady Managers, Colombian Quarter Dollar. The quarter is comprised of 0 0.9000 silver, weighing 6.25 grams with a diameter of 24.3 millimeters and a reeded edge. After all the effort and hard work Palmer and the ladies accomplished, the coin did not sell as well as the Colombian half dollar due to its expensive price and lesser face value. Sadly, 15,809 were melted down and only 24,191 were released into circulation, ironically making it a very rare coin nowadays and worth more than the Columbus coins by far. 
They list anywhere from $325 for an AU50 to $3,750 for an MS66. Most of the structures and buildings were demolished after these fairs and expositions were closed because we are told they were temporary. Through research, I believe that a very small percentage of the buildings that were used for housing exhibits and such were actually built for these events. Most of the incredible architectural buildings that were used could not have been temporary due to their solid construction, of which there are almost no pictures of them being built. This has become quite the topic of conversation recently with many people that believe the history we have been told might not be com completely correct. Ongoing research is getting closer to the real story every day and soon we will all find out how and what really happened in history those days so long ago. So I hope everyone enjoyed my video about the first United States commemorative coins, the part the Industrial Revolution played in it, and how world's fairs and expositions were said to have come about. This has been B, your host, narrator, and researcher. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.